welcome to the uh, center of the study of Europe. Uh, I'm thankful for their support, particularly as the support for this uh, event to happen. I would like also to welcome Ambassador Ferit Hoja with us this evening uh, and to thank him really uh, uh, greatly for having time to be with us given what uh, and where they are right now, not just in terms of the UN Security Council, but also in terms of what's going on around us uh, uh, these days. So before turning to a couple of my points and then to Ambassador Hoja, I just want to uh, make a uh, few announcements. Uh, all guests. Uh, have tight agenda, which means we have to be sharp on time, uh, finishing at uh, uh, 6.30. But this 6.30 is really, really bottom line. Uh, so therefore, no, no playing around that time. So, <laughs> 6.30. Um, uh, then uh, I definitely will save enough time for you to post questions. Limit yourself on questions rather than comments. You are for, free to post questions. I know that we will not, I will promise you, will not uh, say pretend not seeing the elephant in the room right now, which means what's going on in the U.S. Security Council right now since the uh, beginning of October. So, um, therefore, the question that I pose myself often is, are we sleepwalking to a great uh, global confrontation? Something similar to what, uh, something similar to Europe in the beginning of the uh, 20th century, that we are not aware of that. Uh, people, may, many people will agree with this, given the proportion of um, crises, or several crises taking place at the same time. And they can call this time as the most perilous comparing with since the end of the bipolar war. I can just list a couple of them. Uh, you know, this can be Gaza and uh, Israel, uh, and conflict in Gaza, then it can uh, the invasion of Ukraine. Then conflicts that have been almost forgotten regardless of uh, a million of people uh, affected, Syrian and Yemen war, Myanmar, Sudan, Congo. So I can go on and on, on and on. And the one which uh, is in the eyes of many uh, is a looming on the horizon, uh, horizon uh, and it can be, uh, you know, that hopefully not uh, this won't happen, but potential confrontation <coughs> between China and the U.S. So, if we all put this together, then where small countries are, because uh, 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 we have a representative of a small country, and I'm a small country representative, I used to be a small country representative, many write and say that, uh, you know, fragile creatures, small countries remain fragile creatures in the rough sea of international relations. And uh, the rougher sea is, as we can describe this sea as choppy sea, choppy waters, then more difficult for small countries. I would like to see your point. I can disagree with that because if we look at the U.S. Security Council, currently there are three small countries, smaller than five million, in U.S. Security Council, and one smaller than 10 million, which means according to U.S. standards, out of 15 countries right now in the U.S. Security Council, four are small countries. Since 1991, there have been more than 35 small countries in the U.S. Security Council. Uh, this, it is rewarding, but it is challenging, particularly uh, these days. Um, and uh, we are uh, definitely blessed having you, uh, Ambassador Hoja, with us to share your views uh, and experience uh, from a country, from a small country perspective, dealing with uh, global issues, issues that can affect all the globe uh, um, uh, tremendously. So, and you are well, how to say, versed to be there. Uh, your diplomatic career spans more than 30 years. You've served uh, uh, in several places um, in Europe and in the US. You've been, a um, uh, long time ago, Secretary General of, uh, uh, of uh, uh, Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Albania. You served as ambassador in European Union in the late 90s. Then uh, you served as uh, ambassador in Paris and to the UNESCO and to France. Then this is your second incarnation as ambassador of the UN. And well-informed sources, well-informed sources told me, and I can share this with uh, the audience, that your next posting will be Brussels. 
which means the EU again. So uh, I hope that you will be as successful there and bringing your country to the European Union as you as a country have been successful in, uh, in the UN Security Council. Just to make sure that everybody understands uh, here, uh, at least in our region, at least this is my, um, my perception, Albania has been recognized for its proactive diplomacy. Uh, a small country, was, as Slovenia, was chairing the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe a few years ago. As a result of that proactive diplomacy, they are now sitting in the UN Security Council. Uh, this is, in my view, uh, an example of what type of policies or what type of diplomacy small country should be pursuing. Uh, Hoja, uh, Master Hoja or Ferit, the time is yours. I cannot say floor is yours, Thank but you. time is yours. Thank you. Sh shall I sit? Because if I stay, I will be walking, so I will really be disconcerting you. Um, um, Professor uh, Garcevich, thank you so much for this um, uh, kind introduction, and thank you, every one of you, for being this evening with us. It's a delight for me to be here and to have this opportunity to share some thoughts about what we have been doing together with Albana, my colleague, the DPR, is here. Um, and of course, the team that is in, in New York, what we have been doing during these, that those 22 months that we have been in the council, we still have two months until the end, the term um, has ended. Let me tell you a little bit of a real personal experience. So uh, Vesco mentioned that I've been uh, first in the UN and I served for six and a half years. And that was between 2009 and 2000, um, late 15. And for every diplomat, I can tell you, going to the UN is absolutely one part of the sum of the career. It's where the world meets, and I call it the balcony of diplomacy. That's where everybody wants to go. Not everybody does, because these are the places. Um, I was lucky. Now, I was asked to go back again. Um, and when um, we knew that we would be elected in the Security Council, because two or three years before you know it, uh, unless you are in a competition, which we were not, so we worked for 15 years, we campaigned for 15 years, and we were unopposed, but still we did everything as if we would be opposed by someone else. And when we got the call, Albana and myself, um, from the Prime Minister that, look, guys, we want you to go there, it's important, we don't need to explain to you how, what it is, and so on, so on. So I was myself a bag of mixed feelings. I loved it. I was very comfortable. I was in UNESCO Paris. I didn't want to move. But of course, when you are told that you have to go there, and a little bit like soldiers, we just say, yes, sir, yes. So that's what I said. And, but the other problem with me was, OK, we go to the Security Council. That's the first time for 60 years. Albania has not been in the Council. That was the first time. And going to the Council, it's going to interact with the other 14. And within the other 14, you have the five permanent members. So you're really in a disbalanced situation. Small countries are the majority in the UN. And we have a forum of small states, as we call, Besco mentioned, any country that has less than 10 million is perceived, considered a small state. Um, and we are 110, so the very large majority of the 193 countries. But then you go in the council and you have no institutional memory. France, UK, US, Russia and China have been there all the time. They don't go out. They have teams, they roll over, but they transmit their memory so they know what's happening. There are the rules. They know what is not written, and that's what we learned, actually. I'll come back to that. Because everybody can read what is written, but the problem is that in the council, it's very particular. A lot happens in an unwritten way. You had just have to uh, jump into that moving train, and we would jump to a moving train, stay for two years, and get out of the next station. Some others would come. So my feelings were, OK, fine, we'll go there, but then, what are we going to do? We have been campaigning for 15 years, and we have cam we've campaigned on a number of uh, issues. We have six key ideas. How are we going to implement those ideas? How are we going to tell not only the um, political establishment, but also the public opinion? So how would we be working and what it means? Of course, going there, having statements. And I think I've, 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 I've done some 600 <coughs> statements in the, in the, in the last uh, um, 22 months and, and still um, uh, coming. Uh, but okay, that's one thing. We bring a voice, we bring a perspective, that's very good. But then how are we going to have it impactful for, for ourselves so that this unique exper experience, a lifetime experience for me, for my team, for everybody, we will not be back before, I don't know, 35, 40 years, 
if we work for that. So it's, uh, it's, it's really very particular and you don't take it lightly. Before joining somewhere November this time in 2021, so just one, one and a half months before, before joining, one colleague um, just walking in the corridors tells me, oh yeah, congratulations, you guys, you're going to swim with the sharks. And of course I thought, I was saying, of course, you're going to swim with the P5. Um, everybody understands, well, these are powerful, you're the small guys, but, but still they need you and so on and so on. And he said, there are six of them. And I thought, should I ask who's the six? Because I know the five. <laughs> but I was afraid because he would, I mean, I didn't want to look stupid that I don't know the six. <laughs> And then I was thinking and um, I was talking with the team and nobody knew who the six is. We learned it three, three weeks into the council. The six is when the P5 are together. That's the sixth shark. Because they are one, each of them, but when they come together, that's another experience. And we were full of stories that look, I mean, they will do things in your back. They will tell you, this is a paper, take it or leave it. You have 24 hours, just come back with a yes and that's fine. That's how it goes for the Security Council. Actually, it didn't work like that. It might have. There are so many stories. There are books, there are articles that are written like that. But for us, it didn't work like that. Not that we were better, but because of what happened. So um, the sixth shark, I didn't see him. Um, now, um, when what we thought would never happen, when we th what we thought was left in the 20th, 19th, 20th century, when Russia attacked Ukraine, everything changed. We were not prepared for that. And I told you that we had a set of priorities. We would do women in peace and security, human rights and international law, um, delivering through partnerships, uh, accountability, so all these things. And of course, you try to see how during your statements you'll reflect these issues. And during the work in the council, consultations, interactions, you will always support these ideas. And that's fine. But then when Ukraine war or so Russian aggression happened, we had to adapt. Everything changed. We were not prepared for that. But we were, we were extremely, extremely um, uh, wary of what it really means for the UN, for the UN Charter, for international law, for multilateralism, but primarily for small states. Why? As uh, Professor mentioned, we are a small country and we have not invested in a big army. We have an army, we have police, we have security forces, but we have not invested in an army. Because we thought that, especially for those who know this story in my country and our part of Europe, so we were a communist country, one of the most orthodox communist countries, one of the close countries in the late 80s, Albania was compared with North Korea now. Very similar. So completely isolated, completely forgotten by everybody. So when the um, Berlin Wall fell, we thought that we would invest in other things, how to catch the lost time, how to move closer to, the, to Europe, how to build this, um, democratic institutions, everything that we have done in the last three decades. So we don't have a big army. So if Russia fights Albania, we will not lose if we are not helped, if we are not supported, if we don't have the solidarity. So for us, it was extremely important to invest into something else, in what we call the rules-based international order, in international law, in abiding by what we have commonly agreed that is good for everybody, which are Security Council resolutions, GA resolutions for as much as they mean, um, and if they are implemented or respected, but more than anything, the rules on how states should behave. And for us, rules, and we have learned that in the last um, 30 years during our transition, during our rapprochement with the EU, in our um, building relations with others, including um, the United States, that rules are there to be implemented. And if rules are implemented, I should not be afraid that somebody would tell me, look, your house is mine now. We decide like that. No, we have rules, we go to the court, and then we decide. That's what happens in a country should be just um, um, considered what happens between countries. So this is why what happened in Ukraine was a defining moment for us. And we have been, when I say we, Albania and other small states, in the forefront of doing absolutely everything, not only being vocal, but also through initiatives, which I will mention later, to make sure that we do not let Russia go away with crime. War is going on, unfortunately, with consequences with that I'm sure everybody, everybody knows, um, but um, we will not stop 
showing solidarity with Ukraine, countering Russian narrative, exposing Russia and trying to isolate Russia and trying to see how the war could end in a just peace for Ukraine, but in a just peace for everybody. Because if Russia prevails in Ukraine, one of the questions that I asked in the first statement, um, it was in, on the 24th of um, February, Security Council was meeting. We had rumors that the war would start. We knew during the meeting that the war was, would start. And one of the questions that I asked, who's next? And I was very sincere. Because nobody thinks that Russia will stop at Ukraine. If they prevail in Ukraine, why would they stop? They would, I mean, because they are Russian, their narrative that they are trying to save um, um, <coughs> Russian uh, ethnic minorities uh, in different countries, it's not, that cannot be limited only to Ukraine. So it's absolutely extremely important and we're very, very happy to see that the United States have got it right, that Europe has got it right, that NATO has got it right. We have to stand by those who are suffering. We have to stand by those who are fighting for themselves, but fighting for us as well. For us, for the world, for the order that we have uh, uh, established that we should uh, be protecting all, all of us. Now, you go in the council, and you see the P5, and the P5, when you say P5, you say veto. So, so these guys are powerful. These guys are important. These guys decide. They make it or break. When they don't like the resolutions, they just put a tampon, they call it veto, and that's it. It throws, it goes in the bin. So um, then what do you do? So what do we do with, other, with others? Now, no one likes to impose a veto if it's not really very well crafted, thoughtful, probably um, Russia is a little bit reckless now. China uses more and more. Um, US has used it 88 times. That's not, um, um, it's, it's in the mid, mid section. Um, but there have been 365 or just one or less, um, one more or less vetoes in the life of the Security Council. Now, the veto was meant originally when the charter was written as a possibility that in a case, in case a decision in the council would be so detrimental to a, one of the P5, one of the permanent five, instead of going to, to such a situation which could lead to a war, and imagine that the charter was written just after the Second World War, so we are redoing the world with new rules in a different way, so that we develop relations that do not lead us again to a catastrophe. Knowing that in a, in a matter of few decades we had two world wars. So, the veto was introduced that in a situation when four others or more other countries would insist on something, anybody of the big, big powers don't, doesn't get angry enough to start a war, but they impose the veto. But then I have looked in the history and I don't see really any time that the veto was used with that thing in mind. I don't think that we, were, we have been 360 times at a situation that a war would start if there were no veto. Just the veto has evolved as a possibility as a power, as a means for those who have it to use it. I call it misuse it now because it has been used and misused so much, especially, especially now in the last two years by Russia in a totally open, blatant, unacceptable conflict of interest. Russia is a party to a conflict. Normally Russia should not really be deciding because they are a party to a conflict, especially to a conflict that they started. They are the culprit. But unfortunately, this is the situation that we have. So the veto is part of the life of the council. It's part of the um, um, decision making or breaking of the council. And we have to, we have to live um, with that. So now, how did we do in, in the council? So what we, Albania, the Albanian team uh, did in the council, how did we implement or we think that we have implemented um, our, our priorities? Um, the first priority that we um, brought to the Council was women, peace and security. Why? It's a resolution, 1325, adopted more than two decades ago, which calls for a bigger role, a bigger place for women around the table when discussions on peace and security, dialogue, mediation are, are, are called for. And it's absolutely right. And then there have been many resolutions um, complementing that initial resolution. And of course, there have been various degrees of implementation of that resolution. But for us, uh, again, going back to the history of our country, um, it was important to build a society where the role of the women is absolutely the one that they should have. 
equal in terms of before the law, but equal in the society as well, but also empowered to have, to have that role. And we thought that by, um, by putting that bar high in our work in the council, we would first of all show what we are, who we are, what we believe in, but also back home in the council, because what we did in the council has also implication back home. So also the NGOs, all those who are working um, in the same direction will feel more, more, more empowered since we are bringing it as high in the Security Council. Now, let me mention a couple of examples how we have um, worked in the council to, uh, to implement our priorities. The first thing that we did was to use the presidency, you know, Every country has the presidency of the council every month. It's on a rotation, um, alphabetic rotation um, order. Um, and um, we had it twice. Some have it once during their term, depending on the composition of the country, of the, of the council. We had it twice. And during our first presidency, which was June, which is a, considered a heavy month in the work of the council, we tried to bring as many as possible what we call the briefers from civil society. Briefers are persons that are invited to speak to the council on a certain subject. For instance, we're discussing Syria. We will have someone who covers Syria in the Secretariat of the United Nations, someone who has been an envoy of the Secretary General, so people of that category. But also we would like to hear those who are on the ground, those who are working every day, those who know better than anybody, those who know better than those who are in New York. So we call them briefers. And it is extremely important to bring people from Syria or people living outside, but who have a direct connection, who have a direct implication on, on the matter. And it has been very important also to have women briefers. Uh, I think we've done remarkably well. And I'll tell you uh, that during June, we had 19, one nine briefers, when some other countries have had three to five, maximum seven. We did absolutely the maximum for every issue, for every item, for every um, um, file in the council, we thought we need a security, a civil society briefer. And it's very important because those communities in those areas, and consider the council the place where every crisis comes in. It's the place where the misery of the world piles in. Every, the council is not a happy place. The council is a place where you discuss crisis, you discuss um, um, violations, you discuss um, ways to protect civilians, you discuss ways to prevent and to manage or to close uh, conflicts. So it's, it's really a very depressing place, to, trust me. Uh, but it's extremely important to have people from the ground so that those who are there in, in Syria, in Libya, in um, possibly in Myanmar, it doesn't, it doesn't happen very often, um, so they see that their voice is in the council, in the place with the most fantastic visibility um, in any UN structure, in any um, international fora. When the council meets is news, just that the council meets. Keep this in mind. When you see the security council will be meeting this afternoon in consultation, so on, so on, that's news. Nobody knows what is going to be said because when, consulta when we're in consultation, we never tell what we, it's closed meeting. But the importance of the council is such that when the council meets, it's, it's news. Because the hopes of the people are invested there to see these are 15 countries representing the entire UN membership. They will be probably taking a decision that can change things underground. They, are, they have been discussing for f four weeks, for four weeks, twice a day, three times a day, four times a day sometimes, on what is happening nowadays in Gaza. There hasn't been a big success, but every day we advance a little bit more. We see where the positions are, where different interests are um, intertwined, uh, but the council meets and the council um, projects hope. Um, so this was the first thing that we thought was directly related to the implementation of priorities. Second, um, as I mentioned, small countries are directly interested in, in the rule of law. And for us, the rule of law is linked with accountability. Because if there is no accountability, there is no justice. For crimes that have been committed in Ukraine, there should be accountability. We don't have the mechanism now. But we are documenting everything that one day that documentation will be presented in a court of law. It can be a court with the, um, under the um, universal jurisdiction in Germany, in France, probably in US as well, or, or a court that 
if we manage to have a court, a special court. But again, we need that documentation and we need to maintain strongly, strongly and convincingly that crimes cannot go away. Crimes have to be documented and we hope that one day um, accountability exercise will be, will, be, uh, will be managed. So for us, accountability has been central, central, central stage in the Security Council, but also in the General Assembly. And whenever we could not do it, or we could not have a decision in the Security Council, because for, for instance, for, for Ukraine, Russia would impose veto, then we would transfer it to the General Assembly, which has not the same power, but which has the power to show where the world stands. And when you have 143 countries that one are on one side, and when you have one country, a prominent member of the Security Council, a big power, a big player, that stays there with five, which are Eritrea, Syria, um, Venezuela, and um, North Korea, that's nothing to be proud of. So that's where um, the world stands. And that big group of 143 countries has the possibility to make more pressure, has the possibility to tell everybody to public opinion, but also to the public opinion in Russia where the world stands. There is no way that 143 countries are wrong. We did also something else. Together with Denmark, um, Netherlands, uh, Marshall Islands, so small countries, we created the group of friends. There is, uh, in the UN there are 175 group of friends. We're friends of everybody, of everything. So we created the group of friends on accountability for crimes committed in Ukraine. Another way of getting together, and we are 50, 53 countries, getting together, organizing meetings, bringing briefers, bringing speakers, so that we maintain this issue in the council and outside the council. So that was also a way to really implement our, our priorities. Then there is another mechanism, which we call the ARIA meetings. The ARIA meetings, um, ARIA was an, the ambassador of Venezuela when Venezuela was a little bit better than, than they are today. So he was um, the representative in the council and he came with an idea, bright idea, as people sometimes have bright ideas. He said, okay, for things that cannot happen in the council because somebody is blocking, somebody is putting a veto, let's invent a mechanism where we can have an informal meeting of the council so the members of the council uh, participate, but those who organize it, a member of the council, whoever it is, can bring people and they can um, brief the council. We can bring people which would be very difficult to bring in the formal meetings of the council. And we call it the ARIA meeting. It goes on and we have uh, organized um, are there meetings together with the United States, on Ukraine, on human rights situation, DPRK, which was very particular, and even more difficult, on the situation of women in Iran after the big protestations, uh, after the um, killing of, of the young lady that you know. So these are the mechanisms. So what you do, you use absolutely everything that is at your disposal, every tool, and you just don't wait for others to do it. You just jump in. Now. We go there for two years. As I said, uh, I was perplexed how we are going to do, what we do. And then we said, OK, but we are here to work. So one way to work is to grab the pen. What does it mean? To become co-pen holder. There is an, um, a practice in the council that for every issue, so there are 55 uh, is uh, topics in the council. And for every issue, you have a country that is a lead. So if you talk about Mali, France is the lead. If you talk about um, um, Yemen, UK is the lead. It follows a little bit the historic links and implications, um, uh, which some do not like, but this is the history. Um, and it's very good to have a country to have the lead because that country will be always proposing something, calling for a meeting, proposing um, press elements, proposing a, what we call a presidential statement, which is a statement by the Security Council adopted by consensus, or bringing always the first draft of every resolution. No resolution is brought in the Council if, there is no, if it doesn't come from the pen holder. So when Ukraine came, we told the US we want to be co-pen holders because this is happening in Europe, we are a European country. This is happening from a country from the East European group of states. We are a member of the East European group of states. So we want to have a better role. So we told them that we want to bring, bring another pen because we, we, we need two pens for that. Which means that we, on everything that has been happening in the Council on Ukraine, we have been doing that together. And that's showing that you want to be active, you want to be in the front line. That, of course, exposes you a little bit more. Uh, we didn't make many friends in Russia. I know that, but we did make a lot of other friends elsewhere. So that uh, also um, uh, provides, that mechanism provides the elected countries with a 
possibility of being more more, more active and having a um, well, I mean, the voice that that we that we wanted. Um, the um, the fifth element that I want to mention on, on, on the things that, that happen by, by small states is that um, now, what happens when a country imposes a veto? Even if it's our friends, the US, and we're very close with the US, but sometimes they use the veto because they think that this is the best way. Let's wait a little bit more or it's too rushy or the text is not very satisfactory. Or if they think that the text really is disconnected and doesn't bring anything, it's disbalanced and so on and so on. Um, so there is no accountability for, for those who impose the veto. And after the war in Ukraine, which was a defining moment for multilateralism, a small group of states, all small states, came with the idea that any time a veto is imposed, they have to come before the General Assembly where everybody is a member, so 193 countries, and they have to explain how their veto advances peace and security, which is the mandate of the Security Council. How does it help the world to, be a better, to become a better place? Because that's the responsibility of the Council. And how does it help really everybody? And how does that veto represent the work of the Council on behalf of the large UN membership? Now, this is a very small element of accountability because um, Russia has used it four times, China has used it two times, US has used, used it once. So they will have to go back and to explain so it's, it's, I don't think that they like that. It's a little bit more embarrassing than, than if nothing happened. So, and that's also sort of an element of deterrence so that next time before they use the veto, they know that they will have to go back to the General Assembly to really um, tell everybody why they use the veto. So, and this has been an initiative that has been, um, has been done by the small states. Another important thing, which was also introduced by a small state, um, you know why the council is important? because the Council is the first ever in the history of organization, international organization, that is the body which has the power to impose decisions. The General Assembly, its statements, it's a show of support or non-support. Um, there are resolutions there, they are not binding, so nobody has the obligation to put them in practice. It's good if it, they do, but they, it's not an obligation. But what is decided in the Security Council has to be implemented, respected by everyone, those in the Council and those outside, because the Council acts on behalf of the large UN membership. And what the Council does, it adopts resolutions. Those resolutions, they, have, they, br they can bring sanctions, they can um, in, um, authorize UN uh, peacekeeping missions. So these are important decisions. Um, and, um, but the sanctions have evolved. There have been times when the sanction, the, well, the Security Council would sanction the whole country. So why sanction the whole country? Why sanction the whole population? That happens less and less. Now sanctions are very smart, very targeted. So you have individuals or entities who are sanctioned <coughs> because for a, for in, a, in, a, in, a, in a particular setting, they are acting against um, the interest of, 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 of this, their society and so on and so on. And those sanctions now are even more scrutinized by the Ombudsman, which is the um, human rights uh, lawyer of the UN. But in order to make sure that um, when uh, sanctions are imposed, those who should not suffer do not suffer from sanctions, we have adopted a special resolution, which we call the Carve Out um, 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 Humanitarian Resolution, so that the humanitarian actors on the ground anywhere, those who uh, contribute, the NGOs, the UN teams, are totally, immediately, without any doubt, and without any confusion, excluded. And that was an initiative by, by small countries as well. And this is done just two years ago. So it's, it's really um, uh, very, very, very important. So that makes the delivery of aid, which is one of the pillars of the UN activity, um, very important. You will tell me when I stop. I, look, my profession is to make statements. So if, <laughs> if, if, they, if, if they don't stop me, I don't, I don't stop. So, Perfect. so three so, more minutes. Okay, three more minutes. Okay, um, I think it's enough for the, for the UN Security Council statement. Okay, good. <laughs> well, I mean, normally we go five to seven. So only okay. for Ukraine, I would then go to I, eight. I will, I will grant you five. Okay, okay, no, no, that's fine. So um, um, just, just to say that um, small states, uh, especially when they get organized, and um, we have this P5 E10. And the E10, of course, they come from five continents. And they are different countries. I mean, you cannot compare Brazil and Albania. You cannot compare Malta and, and, um, 
I don't know, another country, uh, even with UAE, for instance, which is now, or India, of course, uh, which is now in the council. So we come from different horizons. We have our own interests. We have our own administrations. And sometimes politicians back home will ask us to do something that is absolutely impossible. We never tell them it's impossible. We tell them it's difficult. And we tell them it's very difficult sometimes. So, so when we tell them it's very difficult, they understand a little bit, but they say, yeah, try, try, work a little bit. So um, it's very hard for the E10 to come together. But at very particular times, we can come together. We come together every time when we discuss the working methods of Security Council. So instead of having 10 statements, we have one statement, so we agree among us. And we are trying to come together now on this particularly dramatic times and crisis in Gaza to come up with a resolution because we have seen that um, there have been a number of resolutions proposed, they have been vetoed by different uh, countries. So we're trying to really be the, the bridge makers on, on this issue, trying to bring a text that makes everybody equally unhappy, if not very happy, but at least having a common denominator on this issue. But it doesn't happen all the time, but it can happen. It can happen if we all try to remind ourselves that our job is to build bridges, our job is to negotiate. It's not easy, it can be difficult, painful, frustrating, non-delivery sometimes, but we still have to continue because that is our responsibility. You can have either negotiations, compromise, or a situation where there is a rupture and you have wars. We don't want wars. We think that wars, I hoped, I was naive, that we have let wars um, back um, in time, at least in our part of the world, in, in Europe, that we had constructed things in such a way that we negotiate and we accept to be reasonably unhappy because um, you cannot have 100%. If you want 100%, you have to be just the boss of the bosses. You cannot. So the, our profession is to make sure that interest, our interests are sufficiently um, explained and represented in what we do without forgetting that we have in front of us others who have the same interests or conflicting interests, and we have to just harmonize them. This is what we do every day, and I'll stop here. And please ask questions as you see fit. So uh, thank you, thank you very much for really inspiring uh, and thought-provoking uh, comments and uh, presentation. I have uh, two questions because we still have time. I will turn to you, no worry. But I will, I will pose two questions, and I promise, I promise, I'm giving my promise. Uh, that those two questions are difficult questions. So <laughs> well, you ready? Me right? me. <laughs> so I really what I, what I discussed with my students. Let me begin with the first one. Uh, what I discuss with my students uh, when it comes to resolutions, I always uh, want to highlight the importance of words, and you rightly uh, made this point. Uh, indeed, words matter. And words matter particularly in uh, multilateralism, particularly when you work on uh, uh, draft resolutions. There is one word now, the word, <coughs> which is uh, very important and matters a lot. And it's a stumbling block for uh, resolution to be made, and that word uh, is called uh, you know how. Yeah, I know. Uh, then uh, I'll, I'll tell you. <laughs> okay, can you explain me what's going on in the U.S. Security Council regarding Gaza and why uh, actually um, not just Big Five, uh, but uh, all of you uh, have not been able. I understand the process since I was diplomat and I was working in in the U.N. in, in, uh, in uh, international organizations. I can only make a, make a point from my side. We often blame UN for something that UN uh, is not, um, you know, guilty to, or not responsible. Um, we often associate UN with failures. We don't see successes. We don't see UN providing for people in need. We don't see UNHCR people in Yemen, in Syria, in Congo. Uh, we don't see them in the field. We don't see that, uh, as, as you mentioned last night, uh, uh, around 80 humanitarian workers um, uh, died in Gaza recently, uh, and so on and so forth, which means we don't see that. We just see UN as a, a UN Security Council sitting and having no power, so and being blocked. So, uh, how you can explain the process uh, which is going on right now? Because I know that is in uh, focus of, uh, of not just us sitting here, but I know you cannot say everything, but. <laughs> I'll try to. Yeah. I'll try to. Um, thank you, Vesco. Um, just let's set a little bit of the scene. So what's happening nowadays in Gaza? Everybody has its own opinion. And we see it probably even in your campus. 
Um, but before we take sides, we need to understand. And before we ask others to tell us, we need to um, um, put things in context. We can be pro one, pro the other, or somewhere in between, but with understanding, but just raising a flag. And that's the problem that we have nowadays because people just raise a flag very quickly. Probably, probably, as I've seen and, and, and verified without even understanding what this that you're saying means. And when you ask them, they say, yeah, but I mean, I'm, I, don't, I, I, didn't, I don't mean that. I'm not anti-Semitic or whatever, uh, Islamophobe or so, whatever. But actually what they say is. So now, one thing is that we have the longest crisis in the modern history that is still lingering and not unresolved, the fate of the Palestinians, the right of Palestinians to have their own state. It has been promised. There has been delivery. There are many reasons. There is a lot of explanation. There is a whole history. Who has been wrong? Who has been right? What has happened? Why it hasn't happened? But there is one thing. No country has contributed more than this country, the United States, in trying to push forward and having a solution. If they have failed, it's not their fault. Because they have never been in the situation to have the parties agree on everything. Sometimes on 30%, sometimes 65%, sometimes close to 90%, but it did not happen. Now, this is the problem. What happened on the 7th of October is absolutely something that no one can support. I hope no one supports, although we see what is said and behavior of some. And I hope everybody understands what it means to have families killed in their bed, to have people who um, went in a human safari, killing people in the streets, in their cars, in their bed, in their yards, even those who are parting, people of your age. So that is a pure act of terrorism. And in our world, terrorism is not condoned. Terrorism, terrorism has no explanation. And terrorism cannot and must not justify anything. No one can say that I can kill innocents because I want to do this. That's unacceptable. And that's what happened. Now, this is very basic. Put this in a context of a country, of a society, that in their history, they've known the worst Holocaust. And in their mindset today, they think that this is close to what they've seen during the World War II, when the Nazis wanted to exterminate them. And they think that they are now in a existential mindset, thinking, and obligation. This is what they think. And we have two worlds clashing. Those who think that Palestinians have not had their rights and state, and that's absolutely true. And those who think that the Jews are still under the existential threat and they need to defend themselves. They need to do what needs to be done because if I, if I don't kill them, they will kill me. These are the two worlds that we cannot harmonize today. And the word that the professor didn't mention is the word ceasefire. This is the only word that we have not been able to really find the way to put into resolution because that word is unacceptable for some. And I'll explain what they mean with that. And it's totally the only word to be put for others. It's unacceptable for Israel because they think that I cannot negotiate with terrorists. I cannot tolerate terrorists. I cannot stop the war because I, if I stop the war, they will just prepare and come back and kill me more. They have the right. Every country has the right to protect itself. I was telling to some French the other day, if Monaco would have been Hamas, what, you, what would you do for my country? If the southern part, I don't know, the province in the country would really go and do the same thing, we would do exactly the same thing. Go there, defend, and say that we will kill you before you kill us. Unfortunately, this is the black and white. So for those who say ceasefire because um, innocent lives are being killed, yes, unfortunately, lots of them. And especially those who are suffering twice, probably they are not Hamas supporters. Probably they don't like Hamas. But bombardments, heavy bombardments, and, 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 and warfare in the urban areas is, is horrible. So um, we have tried to harmonize these two at the best possible extent. And we've come with the word humanitarian, tr humanitarian pauses. But it's not enough for some. And we're still trying to see 
how we frame it. There are so many ways to really frame humanitarian policy as part of the efforts leading to a ceasefire or a cessation of hostility. So it's just a matter of wording. But still, that word is the divide. So we have the biggest part of the bridge, but the bridge is not really entire. That word is dividing us. And we're meeting twice a day, as I said, three times a day, to see how we can have that reflected in a way. Sometimes in our work is a matter of time. What is impossible now can be possible tomorrow because things change, mentalities evolve, situation on the ground can evolve and so on and so on. And for this, I'm absolutely sure that it's just a matter of time to have something. Now, why it is important to have a resolution? We, the Security Council, um, adopts resolutions which are binding. So what is what will be adopted, if adopted, has an implication what on, on, on the government of Israel, of course. Uh, and, and it should have also an implication on every party that is part of a conflict, on Hamas as well. But Hamas is a terrorist group, so we don't know how much Hamas uh, cares of what the Security Council does. But we deal at least with democracy, we deal with a state that has laws. And we need to have those laws imp um, implemented. Even wars have laws. You cannot um, use explosives in urban areas. You cannot attack hospitals. You can not attack, attack schools. These are very well, very clearly codified in international law. And when they happen, we should investigate them, why they happened. And they should never be targeted deliberately. There can be um, unfortunate um, um, collateral damage, but it's in the responsibility of those who um, act to make sure that civilians are not harmed. This is one of the failures that we see in this war, that too many civilians, far too many civilians, innocent people are being harmed, are being killed, or are just uh, um, unfortunate collateral damage in, in, in a war, which is a war for survival, as we see, as it, ex as it is explained by the government of Israel. So that is the word that, that we are not uh, trying, we have not found the way to, to come with. Now, what we are doing, uh, since, um, the, P, the, the pen holder tried and failed. Uh, for 10 days, the E10 have been meeting, um, trying to really see how we can find that formulation that makes the P5 equally unhappy, and we still have not found. I can tell you uh, there is a lot of work, there are a lot of efforts. They, they are not seen, they are not advertised, but sometimes there are four or five hours meetings, including today, which I thought it was a free day, a holiday in the UN, but still um, our, team, our teams met for a couple of hours, but we're not yet there, unfortunately. This is the, the sad reality. But you're fortunately with us, you know, because we are fortunate having you with us this evening. So now we can turn to you uh, and take questions from the audience. Uh, if, uh, uh, um, you know, just introduce yourself uh, and, uh, you know, uh, time is yours. Uh, yes, I see. I know some of you, uh, but uh, please introduce yourself anyway, please. First and foremost, thank you for being here. My name is Sarah. I'm a master's student in international affairs and also one of um, Professor Garcevich's students. Um, a question that I have for you is more so talking about how does the UN Security Council handle talking about so many time sensitive and ongoing conflicts all at once? especially like what comes to mind now is probably how what's going on in Ukraine was more of a hot topic and now what's happening in Gaza, probably taking more time away from other issues. How does the UN Security Council balance that? That's, that's really a fantastic question because this is one of the, of the um, um, frustrations that um, myself and I'm sure everybody who works in the council, with, including our teams, has because it's relentless. In 59, the Security Council adopted one resolution and very few resolutions um, during the Cold War for reasons everybody understands. But since um, early um, 90s, the work of the Council has multiplied many folds. Um, there are times when we have 35 meetings, which means many times twice a day. So a meeting in the morning, a meeting in the afternoon. Um, there are open meetings, closed meetings, open debates. Uh, open debates are meetings of the Council when other countries also can ask for the floor and, and participate in the meetings. Um, and of course, it's very, very frustrating to have in the morning Syria and then in the afternoon Myanmar, just as if they were just, uh, um, I mean, things to do. Uh, it's, it has prevented me personally, but I'm sure 
others as well, to go more in depth into uh, substantive issues. Um, you just have to, to deal with this rhythm because um, the, um, the council has a meeting because it has been called in a previous document. So it has to happen within the three months or within twice a month or sometimes every month. We have a meeting, for instance, um, on the Middle East every month. That has to happen. And then we have three meetings on Syria. And then we have a meeting every two months on another issue. So they pile up. And then every, every member of the Security Council can call for a meeting. And I'm responsible. I mean, Albania is responsible for um, close to half of the meeting that we have called on Ukraine. Because it was important for us to, uh, to call meetings on the deportation of children, to call meetings on the um, bombardments of um, ele electro um, electric power stations, to call meetings on the situation of women, on crimes committed in Bucha, or, or, or I mean, in different aspects. Because for us it was important to have the information that comes from the people on the ground through briefers, to brief the council, and to really expose what is happening is happening on the ground. So it is a very difficult. You need to work extra hours. Um, during the six months, for, during the first six months, I would wake up at four o'clock in the morning because I needed to be sure that uh, what we would be saying in the council on important topics for us, Ukraine being one of them, was what we thought should be. Um, and, and the information was always changing. So you would add, until the very last moment, you would add different elements. So just to say that um, when you work in the council, you don't have holidays, you don't have Saturdays and Sundays, you don't have hours. I remember having communicated not only with Albana, but also with other members of the team at one in the morning and asking them, um, just tell me, tell me a little bit of I mean, what, what happened. Probably they were sleeping. I, and many times they responded. So it's, it's, it's absolutely a crazy way of life, but that's the rhythm of the council. And the most painful thing is that we did, and I did not have enough time to go more in depth on certain issues because you have to jump from an issue to another. So you close the dossier and you open the other one. It's as miserable as the, other, as, as the first one, and you have to deal with that. Uh, 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 before turning to you, I would like to give the floor to the, uh, the, uh, 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 my dear colleague, uh, Albana Dautlari, that <coughs> I've known for more than 20 years, or almost 20 years, who also was uh, 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 now um, uh, in the Albanian mission to the UN and served as a, a diplomat in different places, including uh, Vienna, where we met, in the OSC, then in NATO, where we again met, and NATO, then he, she was an ambassador of Albania uh, to, um, to the Council of Europe. So, if you want to uh, make a No, I'll point. just say something. I mean, it's like, uh, thank, uh, thanks, Vasco, and uh, it's difficult, I mean, to add things. I mean, obviously, it's like covering everything, but uh, when it comes to the issues of the Security Council, it's like, once you have the presidency, you think like you can do whatever and so on, and then you get the program and it's like full of meetings that are mandated. I mean, as the ambassador said, you have the mandates and it goes for some issues like every, twice per month, three times per month, like it was Syria, and then you have every three months and so on. But the interesting thing is like, there are so many meetings called because of the crisis, emergencies, that normally Fridays they were left empty. And since we entered the council, I don't remember that we had any Friday off. Mm -hmm. It has been like sometimes you get even three or four meetings, meaning that you start with a regular meeting and then you add like a AOP and then consultations. I remember once it was like we had a retreat because we cover also the working methods of the council, which is like big thing for a small country like Albania. That's why when we talk about small countries, you can do a lot. I mean, the working methods, it was always for big countries and big fights and so on. And we ended up getting the working methods. He is the chair. And actually we have done some, I mean, it's very difficult to change the working methods of the council, but we managed to get like few small things. I mean, few, uh, I mean, few products. I mean, let's say. I mean, he can talk more about that. But I remember on that Friday because they left. I mean, they were uh, for the retreat. We had five meetings, and I was like going from one meeting to another. And at some point, I thought, I hope I don't read the the wrong statement. It became like so busy. I mean, it's like apart from preparing. Okay, I mean, you have the staff, everybody looks at things, but still, 
And it has happened, I mean, we were joking with a colleague, I said, like, I really have to check in which meeting I'm participating, all security council. And they said, actually, we had the foreign minister of your country, it was so busy, and again, he read a statement of something else. Mm -hmm. And people, I mean, you don't dare to stop a minister and so on, but it's so busy, it shows, like, really, you don't have time, and this the ambassador said, it's like, you want to know more because the smallest mistake that you make, you are so exposed. We as diplomats, we are never so exposed like in the Security Council. Everything is public, at least, mo I mean, most of the meetings are open. Everybody is watching. The smallest mistake, you have to reply sometime to one country, like let's say Russia, many times they are accusing us of things. I mean, the Albania, because we have been very hard on them, I mean, when it comes to Ukraine. And it's really, you have to be, to react there. At that moment, the smallest mistake can, I mean, you can be fired sometime. It's not, I mean, that Albania, because it has happened to different countries, Western countries, you are not forgiven. That's why the responsibility that you get always there and so on, I mean, it's, the pressure is very high. But you have to deliver on all the crisis and so on, I and mean, it's like... Yeah. As they say in diplomacy, you can make like many successes, but if you fail once, once yeah. then yeah. it's over. Let me, let me tell you just one, one story, because that one reminded me something. Uh, I was chairing the council, um, and of course we had uh, organized a meeting in Ukraine, and we had invited uh, President Zelensky to speak. It was a time when President Zelensky could not travel, and he didn't travel, it was of course totally understandable. But there is no rule for a representative of a country participating online. Because after the pandemic, uh, there was, uh, everybody has to be there because everybody has representatives, including Ukraine. But we wanted President Zelensky because it was a powerful message coming from the top of Ukraine. So, so we had to really counter Russia, um, including with the vote and so on and so on. So everybody agreed that uh, despite Russia's opposition that President Zelensky would speak and President Zelensky spoke. But then at the end of the statement, and I was not aware, he said, and now I call the Security Council to observe the minute of silence. Now, what can you do? The president of the country asks the council to do, uh, to, to, and everybody raises up. Uh, of course, Russia did as well. But then I mobilized the team and tell, look, let's find out if Russia, who would speak later, a couple of speakers later, would call for a minute of silence for those killed by Zelensky. So it was a nightmare, so how to do, what to do. So we try and, uh, and ask, uh, and ask uh, we did ask the Russian colleagues, so are you going to do that? Because if you do that, I will oppose because there hasn't been uh, any information that Zelensky has killed innocent people like you, have did, you did in Ukraine. So it would be a fight. So that's just to say, and then I thought, look, we need to regulate that. You cannot leave it, leave it um, wild like that. So we worked for a couple of months and now we have what we call a presidential note, which means that it is regulated how you call, who can call, when, for a minute of silence. Just, I mean, nobody thought for 78 years to regulate it. We thought and we did. Okay, uh, good point. Okay, please, I see, uh, see uh, a head over there. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Uh, my name is Brooke. I'm also a master's student here. And kind of on that topic, I was wondering how you go about a strategy when you know you're to bring up a topic that will bring you into conflict with a permanent member. Oh, God. <laughs> Now, not only the, with a permanent member, but with other members as well. Because when you want to be active, you can be liked and disliked because you want to bring issues which are not always of a liking. Remember one thing in diplomacy, whatever you do, whatever you say, whatever you don't say is a position. Sometimes you speak, you say things, and they take you to the world. But sometimes you, you say nothing and they would ask you, why didn't you say anything about that? So it's, it's a position as well. So of course, not always, but um, in, 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 many, in many instances, it can, be, it can be a position. So when we wanted to organize meetings um, um, on specific issues, we would run into situations that a minister of a country, somewhere in the Gulf countries, would call my minister and say, why are you doing this? And the minister is not even aware of that. So he would call me and say to me, why are you doing this? So I would explain to my minister that he explains to the other, and then it goes like that, but you don't like that. Because you don't like to make your uh, administration unhappy because of whatever you do and you say. Now, we run into problems with the P5 very often, especially with Russia and China. Um, we, it depends how you do it. If we do it in a coherent way, which is something that we already have exposed where our position is, then we just say it and we, st we stay our guns. Um, 
But it's a little bit more difficult when you are working with partners. For instance, and for us, the P3, so France, UK, and the United States are partners. We are partners in NATO. We are partners in bilateral relations. We have excellent relations, but it doesn't mean that we agree on everything. So we just have to fine tune it in such a way that it's understood. Because we, if we thought 100%, then we have nothing to say to each other. If we think the same, that's not the case. But mm -hmm. sometimes we tell them in advance. Sometimes we tell them that, look, I mean, we might have an issue, but don't be worried, we'll handle. So we just uh, um, use whatever works best so that it is understood. And then, of course, we try, sometimes we find common ground. Sometimes uh, we disagree, but everybody understands that we have to disagree and that's it. Um, it's just a way of doing things. And of course, we practice, you, you, you know where, where, what, what works and what doesn't. But uh, for Russia, it has been very difficult because we have been extremely, extremely clear, extremely harsh, um, and we have exposed them probably more than anybody in the council. Uh, who else? Okay, please. Um, so I have a question um, in light of the sort of conflict of interest um, that you mentioned posed by Russia being a permanent um, member. And I wanted to ask for you personally, as a diplomatic representative of a small state, do you feel as though measures um, pioneered by small states, such as the one you mentioned, um, where justifications are now required to the General Assembly um, for using vetoes, do you think that that is sufficient to sort of balance power and the interests of small states, or do you feel that there is a need for a deeper systematic reform, and if so, what would that look like? Thank you. Thank you for bringing the issue of the Reform Security Council. Of course, um, the issue of the veto is that there is no accountability. So they impose the veto, it's a right, it's included in the Charter, but as I mentioned, it was included in the Charter with a different mindset, not just using it because you can use it. I know that many times the veto is used for things that are absolutely not justified. Um, two years ago, one country, again a small country, brought into the Council one issue which we think is absolutely important, which is climate insecurity. I think everyone is aware that climate is changing and it's changing very fast and probably it's changing uh, or we are at the point, I hope not, of non-return in terms of um, global warming and of course its implications. But we know that something is happening and we know that that something that is happening can have security implications. People would be um, displaced massively. Um, water is a basic necessity. Um, island countries might lose their, their, their land, so they have to emigrate somewhere. So, and, and these are the easy examples, of course. I mean, there can be um, others much more complicated. So we think that there is merit to have that discussion in the Security Council, which deals with peace and security, because what might happen has an implication on peace and security. And a country imposed the veto on that resolution. So I don't know how you can start a war just because you bring an issue in the Council. So the misuse is absolutely revolting. It's beyond belief sometimes. But there is no accountability. So of course we asked, it was Russia by the way, we asked Russia to go back, to go back to explain, and they explained in their way and so on and so on. And then of course we go to next time. Now, um, this is the system that we have. This is a system that was designed. It has worked. It has failed many times. It is failing time and again. But until we have something else, this is the best that we have. And although the credibility of the Council may have been affected um, um, and diminished many, many times, I think everybody sticks to the system as it is because um, uh, we don't have a better one. It's better to have this system than having nothing. I cannot imagine the, the world without the UN even one single day. It would be chaos. It would be, um, I don't know what it would be, but it would not be at least the place where everybody comes disagreeing, most of the time on many issues, but at least trying to work together. Now, the reform of Security Council, it has been three decades that there is a process, a very orderly process. There are five issues, five clusters on which we work, but there is one fundamental issue that nobody has agreed to so far. Expansion of the Council, because when the Council was formed, there were 45 countries, and it has been the same Council now that we are 193 countries. So the representation is one of the key issues. And there are ideas, proposals, different proposals, but there are at least a number of candidates who want to be permanent because they think that the world has changed, they have changed, they have the, not only the desire, but also the, the, um, um, the legitimacy of being among this small club of permanent uh, members. And you have um, Japan, uh, India, Brazil, and Germany. They are called the G4, so the group of four countries, who want 
and um, uh, um, work every day on expanding the council on both categories, permanent and non-permanent. Everybody would agree to expand the non-permanent, so you just uh, uh, give to different regions one more state and that's, that's easy. But the permanent is, is very difficult because you have other countries who cannot accede to the permanency, but they do not want those countries to become permanent. For instance, China doesn't want Japan to become permanent. Argentina doesn't want Brazil to become permanent. Pakistan doesn't want uh, uh, Germany to become permanent. India, um, um, India but uh, Germany as well. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but, but India was close, yeah. <laughs> and uh, um, probably, probably Italy doesn't like Germany becoming permanent, also because of uh, the world Second World War, the Axis, and so on, so on. So, so it's, it's a process of negotiations, but we are not close to a reform. But we are a little bit torn between, between partners uh, who want to become permanent and partners who do not want to let those become permanent. So we don't really take a decision. We say just whatever, agree between you and then we will solve it. But I'm not sure that if we expand the council from 15 to 25 or to 30, we have it more efficient, more um, product oriented. So we are torn between what we have, which, which is imperfect, and what we want, which may not be um, efficient. So it's just an ongoing discussion. There are different um, um, initiatives, for instance, for the category of countries who could be elected for four years, or for six years, or for consecutive terms, and so on, so on. So all these are part of a discussion for reform, but um, we're not yet there. Uh, from my mother's point of view, I think that the idea to enhance the role of UN General Assembly is the right one in given situation. But I just want to make uh, and, uh, to tell you that uh, this um, uh, resolution on the, uh, uh, which was uh, endorsed by UN General Assembly in April 2022 after the invasion of Ukraine was supported by three uh, permanent members, UK, France and US, was blocked by uh, uh, Russia uh, and China okay. abstained. So, so that's just to uh, see the, the logic behind and the dynamics in the UN. And the, I would say that if there is only if there is an issue uh, where those five, regardless of their ideological difference and indifference in interest, are somehow on the same page, it is um, not to give up their power. Yeah, uh, let, let me tell you also one thing which I can disclose, and then just just thirty seconds. Um, in what we have been doing these uh, three and a half weeks, crazy, crazy weeks since um, the war in, um, I mean, since the uh, attack of Hamas and then the war in Gaza started, is that um, we have been advocating in a very cynical game of having a text which allows those who have um, the power to influence Israel, and in this case, the US, giving them through the Security Council the means to really go and talk to Israel with a document that has been approved by the Security Council. But we have been trying to resist the very cynical game by Russia, and I can say it because I say it publicly, so I can say it now, the very cynical way in that to have a text which makes it impossible for the US to be, to accept, so that they are obliged to put the veto. And we said, no, 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 this is the wrong way. We don't want the blame game here. We want a text which is fair, balanced, but also which gives to the sole power that has the capacity to influence those on the ground, and particularly Israel, to tell them that, look, we need a few military pause because the Security Council has decided, but something that is doable. So we've been in this, in this cynical game, which um, Russia mostly, but also some others have been playing, just trying to put enough impossible words in a resolution so that it, it may, which it makes it um, impossible to be adopted by, 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 by others, in this case by, by the P3, so by UK, by, by France and by, by, by the US. Uh, anybody else? We have, oh, I see now, one, two, three, four. So therefore, we have to speed up. We have 15 minutes left. I don't... I I'll don't, be short. Uh, those four, you will be given a chance to post questions. Then I will pick two questions uh, now and then two questions later on. Two questions. Uh, uh, in the second row. Uh, are you going also to pose a question? Yes. But then you are the fifth one. Okay. Uh, uh, you and you, first of all, two of, two of your questions, please. Introduce yourself and then uh, pose a question. 
Hello, my name is Anna Malkin, I'm a senior. Thank you so much for speaking. Um, this might be kind of a contradictory question, but is there any advantage to having no institutional, you know, memory in some ways? Like, of course, like, having not had that experience, you can have other like, documents to rely on, but at the same time, you can set a new precedent, which potentially could be an advantage. So no, because no, let us yeah. take uh, the, the, one, the second one. Yeah. Hi, um, my name is Yama. I'm a graduate student here in Diplomacy and International Affairs. So my question is, as you just mentioned, the word uh, ceasefire is now it's like untouchable and impossible for Israel and uh, Hamas conflict. So I'm just wondering from your perspective as a UN security member, do you think the ceasefire, the word ceasefire, is perceivable now for the Ukraine situation and also do you think the impossibility of ceasefire in that Middle East conflict has anything, any, any impact on the situation of Ukraine? Um, institutional memory. If you do not have sufficient information what has happened in the last 78 years, it will be very difficult to come up with a resolution. Because you have to really have in mind everything that has been adopted on this issue prior, before proposing a new text. So that's important. Of course, you can ask for research, you can ask someone to really go back and work in, 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 in the library um, to, to check the records. Um, that's one thing, documentation, records, uh, references. Second, when you're chair of the Security Council, there are rules, but that's, that can be 30 to 50 to 70 percent. The 30 percent is diffused. There can be precedents, something that happened in 55. I need to know that because I can use that. And multilateralism and the UN particularly works on precedence. If it has happened once, it could happen twice. There are things, of course, that happen for the first time. But the problem that when you're new and um, the first time can be also the biggest blunder they will make. So we do not want to make mistakes and blunders. So it's extremely important to have that institutional memory and to have uh, as much as possible so preparation. That's why teams prepare. Um, some prepare years in advance, some prepare months in advance. Uh, it's, it's extremely important to be, um, to be empowered. And it's not just one person. You have the whole team who needs to interact with others. And then when you interact with those who have been there rolling, you don't want to feel belittled that you know less. You want to be at par. So it's, it's extremely important. Um, then ceasefire. Now, ceasefire in Gaza, ceasefire in Ukraine. Ceasefire in Gaza has been ruled out by Israel. And for the reason that they say that we cannot have a ceasefire because we do not want to let Hamas regroup, reorganize, move their equipment, um, because things are becoming even more difficult. Imagine to go and fight with tanks and artillery and whatever means that they have in the most populated area in the world. How challenging that must be how difficult it must be, how impactful that must be. So um, they think that they have a mission. Their mission is to eliminate Hamas because they are terrorists and because they want to liberate Gaza from Hamas. So th it has to be relentless. And from a, not only from a political point of view as they see it, but also from a military point of view, they think that that has to be done before anything else can happen. So impossible. I'm not saying that, they say that. And of course, if they don't accept it, then we're not very advanced very, very, very far. Although other ideas have been mentioned, like we support the humanitarian pause, for instance, 24 hour pause, so that humanitarian aid can be, uh, can be delivered to those in need, so that those who uh, um, need to uh, collect the bodies of people that have been killed or to bury them in dignity. So you always need those humanitarian pauses for, 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 for these very basic, but very important and dignified moments. In Ukraine, um, that's a very different situation because you have a very large front. It's more than 1,000 kilometers front. So um, ceasefire, there have been pauses of hostilities for exchange of prisoners, for instance, and they are agreed by the ICRC or whatever, whoever is, is a broker in, in these moments, but they are very, very, very short. Now, you can have, you can have um, truce, you can have ceasefire, you can have cessation of hostilities, you can have pauses. So all these things can be more or less the same. It depends on the duration. You can call it the way you like. It can be a pause of, of 48 hours. It can be a, a ceasefire of two, of two hours. So it, it, it doesn't matter much. What matters is to agree on why you need it, how do you use it, 
and how the parties do not perceive it as an advantage of the other to reorganize and to move troops and to, uh, to have a more um, advantaged position in terms of tactics of war. So, of course, it's up to those who are, um, it's up to Ukrainians, to their army, to their generals, to their commanders to, um, to decide if they need it and for what they need it. But as I see, we're not close to that even, even either in Gaza, which is um, a, a reality, but in Ukraine as well. Okay, two more questions uh, to persons over there. Uh, please, I see three, but uh, don't, uh, uh, don't, uh, I don't want, but this will be a concluding, uh, a concluding round of questions. So two from you, the last row, and then you guy, uh, from uh, the last row. So go one by one. Um, hi, I'm Tyler Stinson. I'm a senior. Um, I was wondering if you would see, like, in the future, that, like, um, a per permanent member of the Security Council would, like, lose his, like, membership. Like, for example, Russia right now, like, with the invasion of Ukraine, so it's, like, actively, like, violating the promotion of safety and security in the world, and then also it finds itself in, like, a very, like, powerful spot as they, like, can block every, like, agreement reached out in the UN Security Council that would maybe, like, advantage the Ukraine. Um, they could, like, veto it. So, like, would it be possible in the future that they could lose the no, membership? May I just not go over them, please? Uh, in many ways, the UN is the world's premier forum. Like all forums, it's plagued by misinformation. Um, what ways does the UN fight back against misinformation, and is there anything we can learn for all of our conversations? And the third one, and the last one. Um, my name is Pierre, uh, Master of Students in uh, International Affairs and Diplomacy. Uh, as someone who's also coming from a very small country, Norway recently also served at the Security Council and recently held the presidency. Um, I find it very interesting what you were saying about uh, small countries, or at least the E10 having the role of grid makers. Um, it almost sounded like there is an extra responsibility and almost pressure on the smallest countries of the council. Um, and want to talk a little about uh, that sort of responsibility of the smallest country, countries. Okay, Russia, uh, can they lose the seat? No, they cannot lose the seat unless they resign. And I don't see them close to resigning. Otherwise, it will not happen. There is no mechanism, there is no even theory. Um, because um, for anything that changes the charter, because the permanent members are part of the charter, you need two thirds of the um, UN membership, including the permanents themselves. So I don't see the permanents themselves really um, acting um, against themselves. So unfortunately, no. Unless, <coughs> unless one day with a new reality, with a new leadership in Russia, with a new understanding in the world, with a new concept of the world, that might eventually happen in a reorganization where they find their place. But frankly, I don't see a, a, a way that Russia cannot have its seat, like for the US or France or um, there have been ideas, for instance, that France and, France and UK, when they were members of the, um, of the um, um, European Union, they could have one seat of the European Union instead of having just two uh, members of the European Union. But uh, uh, that's not going to happen. Um, the um, misinformation. Now, misinformation, disinformation, um, or speed information, unchecked information, um, is part of our reality. And it has increased, I don't know how many folds, with the social media. So everybody is a journalist, everybody can be a photo reporter, everybody can publish news, everybody can publish rubbish. In, in. But it's, it's, it's the responsibility of everyone to check what we read, what are the sources, to have a critical mind, to have a critical reading, and to check different sources on, on the same thing. Um, that's at least what I, I teach to my, 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 my kids. Um, yes, the UN is faced with that, especially in certain settings, in certain countries where the peacekeepers are under pressure from different parts, sometimes from the government, sometimes from the opposition, sometimes from different parts of the society. And of course, it's very hard to work uh, against uh, misinformation. You need just strategic information communication. Look what happened with the hospital, the first hospital that was uh, um, I mean, it was believed for a couple of hours that Israel bombed an hospital that were 500 uh, um, killed. I mean, it's shocking to everyone. And we saw the world, I mean, really uh, go crazy. People rushing to the uh, doors of the US embassies in various um, countries in the Middle East. 
And actually, that was not true. I mean, it seems, and it's more and more credible that it was a, a missile that was misfired or, or was caught in the, in the air that fell down. And of course, it was the, uh, the fuel of the, of the, of the rocket that, that, uh, that uh, um, was the, the cause. So, so these things are extremely dangerous. Or sometimes we've seen, we've seen for instance, acts um, um, on social media of horrible acts um, um, that have triggered uh, um, mass protestations and with victims in India, in Pakistan. So it's extremely hard as well. We're not, uh, we're, I mean, no one, no one is, um, is immune, immune to that, but everybody has to make, uh, to do its, its, its job um, and, and really fact check everything before we retweet. That's extremely important. We should not retweet without reading, understanding and being sure because we retweet, somebody does the same thing. And of course, from one, it goes to uh, 100,000 in, in a click especially especially for stories which are absolutely absolutely stupid today there was a there was a news and it was it was really shared immediately with the security council that uh, we had the news and we had a short video that uh, one i don't know militant group from from close to hamas um, uh, was um, trying to kill mahmoud abbas and it was extremely troubling so we thought we'd call a security council meeting we needed to know what it is actually it was absolutely something completely rubbish so we just went back checked we called our intelligence services uh, to just to make sure that they had something so it is absolutely a real problem everywhere for everything including including the the un now for the small countries and you mentioned norway and we have worked uh, one year um, with, with norway and absolutely a trusty partner absolutely a um, fantastic team um, and, and of course a representative of um, small countries um, um, being active, being ambitious and trying to really leave a mark uh, and, 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 and they've done, they, they've done so. Um, well, we've seen in the council also St. Vincent to the Grenadines, a very tiny small country and they try to do, um, to do their, their best. They try to bring the voice and of course, um, you try to bring your own interest, but also in the category of small countries, your voice resonates a little bit more with um, those who are like you. For instance, they were bringing more the issues of climate insecurity for obvious reasons or small countries and island countries. So um, this, is, this is what um, um, the, the, um, the, the two years are, are, are used for, uh, for, for, for everyone in that category. For us, it was extremely important to really uh, bring a voice um, in favor of um, the um, profound values to which we are uh, irreversibly attached, which are human rights, accountability, rule of law, inter uh, rules-based international order, and, and trying to, uh, to really federate uh, as, as many as possible around these ideas, because we think that these are the future of relations between countries rather than the opposite, which we have seen through history. Uh, okay, we have a few minutes left, then I will conclude briefly and I have a brief question for you and I would like to uh, your honest answer from both of you. So then, uh, you know, nothing new if I say if it uh, was a famous quote from uh, Doug Hammerskjold, one of the uh, most respected Secretary Generals of the UN in the eyes of many, including me, the, definitely the best Secretary General ever, who once said, actually here in the US in 1954, but not in this city in Los Angeles, that so the UN was not created in order to bring us to heaven, but in order to save us from hell. Um, it saved us at least since the end of World War II from hell. Uh, you have not seen uh, this sixth P, which means not seen those five uh, big ones working together in your terminal office, in your time uh, in the UN Security Council. But this doesn't mean that we cannot hope for this to happen in the future, because the UN still remains, with all due respect for it, you know, and for its um, mistakes and um, challenges ahead, remains um, a platform, the only platform for global cooperation, political cooperation among countries. Uh, and uh, uh, it possesses normative power that small countries like. And my question for you, both of you, now there are two months left uh, and your term, you know, term as a uh, non-permanent member is over. Are you happy because of it? Um, I've had the, um, the impression that uh, for the last 22 months I have been swimming in an ocean of despair. 
as we mentioned, going from one crisis to another, from one dossier to another, from one desperate situation to another. But I've been empowered by the hope that every meeting has given to those who want to hear others, to see others work for their problem. And hope is what keeps us alive. Hope is what dies lost. And for as long as we have institutions, however unperforming at times, however failing at times, hope is still there. That's what keeps me still in my profession because I think that diplomacy is not something that delivers immediately. Sometimes what we are discussing today will be, uh, we will, I will not be, see, be seeing the fruits of them now or, or, or later, but everything that we do, I want to believe, helps to advance um, issues, help to, uh, to save lives in the world, helps to bring uh, light where there is darkness and helps to really mobilize people, um, keep faith in the system, keep faith in, um, in, in the laws and try to do their best in, in every little circle around us, with our families, with our friends, with our elected, with our um, countries uh, and of course um, in, in the world as, as such. Um, we will depart from the, from the Council with a world that is worse than when we entered. It was not our fault. We tried to do our best to fight it. Uh, but sometimes this is the reality. Um, and the Council today reflects the um, complexity of the world. Um, but we've seen worse. And um, I don't think that we are at the point of a big danger. It, the situation is dangerous, painful, with consequences. But I think that um, we are at a moment when we still need to think how we can perform institutions, how we can do better, how we can work more, so that uh, we do not let things escape of our hands, but we take and, and, and master them. But we will leave the Council with one thing, which was our priority. When we say and when we read in the, um, um, uh, in our, in the World Constitution, which is the uh, UN Charter, we the people, it doesn't mean we the men, it means also we the women as well. And from that perspective, uh, we mean to make like the final point. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, it's, uh, am I, I mean, I think I'm ready to leave the council. It's like it has been the experience of my life. I mean, as I said, I've been like 23 years doing multilateral. I'll move to bilateral actually after this. It will be like very quiet. But I think after two years, I'm ready to leave the council. It's uh, very demanding. The issues, I mean, it's like, it stresses you because you cannot do much, as uh, we said. Although I still think that UN is a great organization. I was like always thinking that why, do, why we need UN and so on, such a big, I mean, especially when we have regional organizations and so on. But without UN, millions of people will not get the food every night, I mean, every day and so on. It's places that single governments can never access. I mean, even big countries like US, many places they cannot have access without having the UN there. And uh, even private sector, I mean, cannot access places. And that's why we need organizations like UN, even for that. I mean, not to talk about many other things, development and so on. That's why, I mean, we never see the positive I mean, thing because we see only the problems. And when you do a lot of things, you always also fail. But being in the council, I think that's why they've been so smart when they invented the council. Two years for elected members, it's more than enough. It's because it's very demanding. I mean, it's for your administration, for the staff there, and for everybody, because you really, the responsibility that you carry, it's very high, and that's why you really, after two years, you are exhausted, physically, mentally. That's why, I mean, you'll feel bad when you leave, because the attention that you have when you are there, many colleagues after they leave the council, they leave you in as well, because it's horrible to go back to normality. But uh, also I think uh, the P5, when they invented that, I mean, I think they wanted us to leave because we know too much after two years. <laughs> <laughs> after two years you have to leave because it's difficult to control you. And I can tell you in the beginning when you arrive about not having this, I mean, uh, the sixth sharp, 
I think they behave in the same way. Once you enter, they all try to meet with you, with your teams and everything. They want to know exactly what you think. Even for personal things, they really scan you on everything, on all the issues, what you think. And they do the, the exercise. Each of them does it with all the incoming five. And it's very interesting to see them, how involved they are with you and so on, because it means that you, it doesn't matter if you are small or big, you'll have one vote there. Yeah. That's why they are interested for these two years on you. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you.